Thank you so much for that, Brother Chuck. Good morning. How's everybody doing? Good morning. It's so good to see everybody. So thankful to have visitors here. I know there are so many people that are under the weather, sick, not feeling well. So if you can, just lift them up in prayer. It's kind of interesting right now. This section is empty. Usually it's full. So I just praise the Lord for goodness and mercy, and hopefully everybody gets better soon. If you take your Bibles with me, please, and turn to the book of 2 Samuel. <clears throat> As you're turning there, just a few quick announcements. I would just like to thank all the men who came out to the men's prayer breakfast yesterday. It was a wonderful time, and we even met a few men from uh, another local church down the road, and they joined us, so that was a blessing. And uh, starting next month, on the second Saturday of the month, we'll be having it here in the fellowship hall. And so if you'd like to be a part of that, please come, and we'd love to have you. Also tomorrow, I just do want to make a quick announcement, I'm not sure it was announced, but uh, Mrs. Denise's father went, to home, went home to be with the Lord last week, and the service visitation will be at 10 o'clock tomorrow morning, and the service at 11 following. So if you can, please be there to support uh, the Latimers, I'd greatly appreciate that. And then lastly, one thing I do want to announce is every Saturday morning around 9 o'clock, we'll be gathering here uh, to go out soul winning, so if you'd like to be here and be a part of that, we're going to be hanging doors, bags on doors, and just trying to reach our local community, and uh, if you can, please come be a part. I would love to have you here. And if you say, well, Brother Zach, I can't do much, we can at least have you here putting uh, tracks and invitations, stuff in bags. Uh, And if you can, please uh, be here. So if you take your Bibles with me, 2 Samuel chapter number 11, and uh, hopefully this morning, I promise not to keep you long. I am excited to share this message with you. The Lord this year has put on my heart that that we really focus more on Him. Because as churches in today's society, we realize that people are leaving the church and they're forsaking the church and going back to the world. And so I hope this year as a church that we can recognize the glory of God, the empathy, the, the empathy of God, but most importantly, the power of God that we can draw closer to Him. And as we read God's Word this morning, I hope that as I pray aloud, please pray with me that God speaks to you. Because I can't change you, the deacons can't change you, the sound tech guys can't change you. The ushers can't change you, but God can change you. So I hope this morning you're seeking the Lord Jesus. And as I pray aloud, please pray with me. Our Father in heaven, Lord, I thank you so much for your goodness. I thank you so much for your mercy. I thank you so much for Redline Faith Chapel and the mighty faithful folks that are here. Father, I pray this be the year that we be as closest to you as we've ever been. Father, I pray that we not let the world get between us. Father, I pray right now that all distractions be laid aside. I pray that we leave them at the door. Father, I praise you so much for the visitors that are here today, and I praise you so much for the faithful folks. Lord, I do lift up all the people that aren't feeling well, and Lord, you know them. You know exactly what they're going through, and Father, I pray you just restore them, Lord, and be able to help them be able to come back to the fold. And Father, I pray as we open the Word of God this morning, please help me to slow down and help me to be clear and precise. And Father, ultimately, I pray that we point each other to you, and Father, I pray we serve you. I pray for laborers. Father, I pray that you build this church upon this rock and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Lord, we need you this morning, and I pray, please, Father, hide me behind the cross. Speak to your children in only ways that you can. Lord, I'm just a man. Lord, we need you right now, this very moment. I pray that your word not return void. We give you the glory, we give you the honor, and we praise you in the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. If you look at chapter number 11 of the second book of Samuel, the Bible says this. It says, it came to pass after the year... It was expired the time when the kings go forth to battle, and David sent Joab his servant with him and, if, and all Israel, and they destroy the children of Ammon and besieged Rabab. But David tarried still in Jerusalem. This morning, and if I were to title the sermon as you see on the screen, would be the ripples of sin. Has anybody ever skipped a rock across water? Isn't that fun to watch? Sometimes they fall short, don't they? They just bloop. But sometimes they just keep going, and ripples keep getting created. But one thing, if you've ever stopped and looked at a ripple, the ripple starts in the middle, and it goes outward. If you think about the power of sin this morning, it starts on the inward of the human being who is sinning, and it works its way outward. Because the thing that I want to look at the most this morning, at the life of David, David was a powerful man. But one thing that David that I want to point out this morning about the life of David is this. Every battle that he went to, he was always in the front. Every battle that he prepared for and took his men into, he led them. But at this battle, he stayed home. 
You know, the Bible talks about in our sin that if we're not laboring, if they're not working, if we're not seeking to please the Lord, we're living in sin. And this morning, I hope that we understand that sin is powerful, that sin can take over your mind and your body. But most importantly, Jesus Christ came to die for your sin, and we no longer have to enjoy the things of sin, but the things of God. But here in verse number two, the Bible says, and it came to pass... In an evening tide, that David arose from off his bed and walked upon the roof of the king's house. And from the roof he saw a woman washing herself, and the woman was very beautiful to look upon. And David sent and inquired after the woman, and one said, It is not Bathsheba, the daughter of Elam, the wife of Uri, the Hittite. Now here I want to show you something, because David, Uriah, was David's right-hand man. In every battle that took place, David and Uriah were together always. And knowing that he was out there, the moment they told him, hey, now listen, one, you shouldn't have been looking over there, amen. But two, he should have stopped right then and there and said, wow, this is my right-hand man's wife. What am I doing? Here's the power of sin, ladies and gentlemen. If we think about sin this morning, sin can come into your life and can distraught your what the Bible called and what the world calls your conscience. You either have a good conscience or a bad conscience. And that moment, being David, one, the Holy Spirit came, would have came upon him and said, hey, what are you doing? But his conscience was so weary and he was so woven because of war that he took upon himself another man's wife. How often do we allow sin to come into our life and affect our every decision? This morning, we've got to lay the world aside. We know the world is going to lose. Jesus Christ is already the victor. We know that he has won. But the most important thing that we need to cling to is the cross. Because even though you're saved this morning doesn't mean you're going to stop sinning. Amen? If you've stopped sinning, can you tell me how? Because I would love to know. Because the thing we realize today in this world, the world's going to do anything and everything, anything, anything, everything and anything they can to keep you from sinning. I'm sorry, I get excited. I start getting tongue-tied. The thing that we have to realize today, let me slow down, is the world, they think they're powerful. Satan thinks he's powerful. But aren't you glad that we have an omnipotent, omniscient God, the one who sent his son Jesus Christ to die for our sin? Because this morning, where would we be without Jesus? But here, David, right, one, he looked and saw this woman. He should have stopped right then and there, went back into his chambers, and went to bed. Amen? Because a lot of times in life, the world's going to keep saying, hey, temptation's real. Hey, come over here. Hey, come look at this. Hey, come watch this. Hey, come say this. Hey, come do that. Temptation is real, but can I tell you this morning, there is no such thing as secret sin. A lot of times we try to take our sin, we hope the world don't see it. We'll go out in the backyard and we'll dig a hole and we'll spiritually bury our sin. We'll try to take our sin we'll try to put it in the closet saying, well, nobody will ever know. Well, nobody ever saw it. Nobody ever heard it. I did this. I did that. But not the world not going to know. But you know who knows? And the most important is the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the intercessor between us and God. He knows our sin. The Bible says that he knows our heart. And David, the Bible says, was a man after God's own heart. And can I encourage you this morning, David, a man after God's own heart, if he can fall into sin, guess what? We can too. And if we think about the power of sin and why sin is there, Jesus Christ didn't come to cleanse us from ourselves. He came to cleanse us from our sins and our unrighteousness to, because we are not holy and we'll never be holy, but we serve a holy God. A God who sent His Son, Jesus Christ, to be the intercessor, to die for our sins, to free us from that bondage. This morning... I can freely admit and say I've been in handcuffs before. I'm not uh, proud to admit it, but man, I'll tell you what. When I was in the military, I was a hard head Fred. I would do anything and everything I could, and I stayed in trouble. But I, but I tell you what, that day that those shackles went on my wrist, I looked down and I thought, what in the world is going on? You can't get out of those things. You can be Houdini, but I promise you ain't getting out of those things. When they turn that lock and key and they lock it for the third time, them jokers are on like glue. You're not going to separate it. But the thing I thought about when I was looking at those shackles is, why did I do the things that I did? Why did I say that they, what got me here? What am I doing? And it's because of my sin. And those shackles and that bondage was keeping me from God because I was enjoying sin more than I was enjoying God. 
And you know, the thing I think about this morning is this. If we're living and enjoying sin, we're not following God. You can be saved this morning and still be sinning, but if you're not following God, you're living in sin. If you're enjoying the world more than you're enjoying Jesus Christ, you're living in sin. If you're enjoying more of the things of this world and you're not coming to church when the doors are open, you're living in sin. If you're enjoying the things of this world and going out and doing other things to please what the Bible calls is the flesh, we're living in sin. But what we have to realize is the Bible says to forsake the sin and come to the presence of Almighty God, come boldly before the throne of grace, begging God forgiveness. Because in 1 John, the Bible says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. This morning, I hope that you have a desire to be sinless and to serve the Lord Jesus. You're not going to be sin, you're still going to sin, but we want to sin less. Amen. I want to be better today than I was yesterday. I don't want to be like David looking at a woman over, on, over there on the yonder. And thinking, wow, man, she's beautiful, but guess what? Can I tell you this morning, anytime you see something in the world that looks good, that looks great, and you want it, it's usually bad. Amen? It's usually bad. But not only do we know that sin is not secret, in the book of Ecclesiastes chapter 12 and verse 14, the Bible says, For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. God knows everything. We can't hide from God. We can't outrun God. The thing we should do is be coming to God, repenting of our sins and asking God to help us to be diligent, to walk after God, to please the Lord Jesus, and to do all that we can to serve Him. In Psalms 44, 21, the Bible says, Shall not God search this out? For He knoweth the secrets of your heart. This morning, the heart, the Bible says, is the root of evil, right? When you think about the abundance, the bad, the things come in our heart because the moment our mind sees and does things, temptation and the things of this world, it comes down to our heart. It trickles. I call it the trickle effect. And when things trickle down from my heart, from my head to my heart, the things in my heart is what comes out in my hands. Now, here's the thing this morning, folks. If you're laboring for God and you're doing the things of God, it's going to be harder to sin. Amen? If you're laboring for the Lord and you're staying faithful, the Bible says, it's going to be harder to sin because my mind, my body, my hands, and my heart are going to be on the Lord Jesus, begging God to direct me, to guide me, to help me, to please Him, to walk after Him, to justify, to tell people, to be a witness, to testify. There's so much goodness in God that if I'm focused on God, I'll be sinning less. So this morning as a church and as beginning a new year, I hope that we can say, Lord, I want to sin less. I want to be in the presence of God. I want to seek the face of God. And ultimately, I want to achieve the Lord's, the Lord's will for my life. In Luke 8, 17, the Bible says, For nothing is secret that shall be made manifest, neither anything hid that shall not be known come abroad. So let me just tell you, you may think it's in secret, but it's going to find out. I want to show you something. Look at verse number four. And David sent a messenger and took her. Now, hold on a minute. So David, being the king, didn't walk over there and say, hey, Bathsheba, knock on the door. Hey, how you doing? What you, what you doing? What you got going on? No, he didn't do that. He sent a messenger. So when you think about sin, the moment he asked his messenger, knowing who she was to go get her, now that sin that's in his life is now affecting the messenger. And if you don't realize today that your sin affects the people around you, then you're not realizing what sin really is and the power of it. Your sin and the things we choose to do and not to do will affect the people around you. Now, if you're coming to church faithfully, if you're reading your Bible, you're praying, you're seeking the face of God, and people around you see that, what do you think people are going to do? People are going to be like, man, look at this person. Look at God changing them. Look at God filling them. Look at what God is doing for them. But if you're not coming to church and you're not reading your Bible and you're not praying, now what do you think people are going to do? They're going to be like, man, that person is a hypocrite. But guess what? We're all hypocrites because we, as Paul says, I'm the chiefest of sinners. I do the things that I shouldn't and I don't do the things that I should. Today as a church, I hope that this year we say, God, we want to do the things of God. We want to build this church upon this rock and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. We want to fulfill the promises of God, fulfill the commandments of God, and be in the presence of God. Because how many of you like blessings this morning? Amen. We want God's blessing on this church. 
But not only do we see that the, the sin is not secret, in verse 4 through verse 17 is the deepness of sin. Because when you skip a rock across the water, bloop, 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 what does that rock naturally do at the end? It sinks. Do you know that the death of sin, death bringeth forth sin, and we know that there's only one way to go, either to heaven or to hell. If you're saved this morning, we confess our sins, and he's faithful, just forgive our sins. But if we're not saved this morning, and you haven't confessed your sins, you're on your way to hell. There's no way to sugarcoat it. There's no way to fix it. There's no way to patty cake it. This morning, if you're not saved, you're on your way to hell. It's simple. The Bible makes it pure. It makes it clear. The evidence is there. A lot of people science to say, well, I need evidence. Well, I need this. Well, I need this. I need a theory and a theology and a, com a, communi a cumulative idea to put this all in one big picture. Well, I have it for you. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was God, the Word was with God, and the Word of God became flesh and dwelt among us. In the beginning, God created the heaven and earth, and in the end, God will destroy and make the new heaven and earth. That is the end, period. Actually, we'll put an exclamation point there, because it's the truth. It's the everlasting truth. And if you'd like to challenge it, please do, because God will show you and prevail to you that he is the author and finish of our faith. He is the King of kings. He is the Lord of lords. He is the great I am. He is Jehovah Jireh. He is Yahweh. He is the everything that we need, and his name is Jesus. We're sinners. we got to come to this cross and beg God on our knees because the Bible says that one day every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And if he is not your Lord today, I pray that today be the day of salvation and he become the Lord of your life to realize we cannot do it without him. Because sin, it's not only not secret, but sin, it's got deepness. In verse number 6 of chapter number 11, it says, And David sent Joab, saying, Send me Uriah the Hittite. And, jo and Joab sent Uriah to David. Now think of this. I want you to stop a moment. Uriah was on the battlefront, way out there. He looked at Bathsheba and said, Ooh, she's pretty. When we look at sin in this world, how often we say, Ooh, I like that. I enjoy that. But not only did he affect the messenger, but now he's affecting the man of God who stood by him and battled and toiled with him and fought against the Philistines and the Malachites and the Amorites and all the different battles stood right there beside him. But now he's going to take his life because he enjoyed it so much. Do you know sin will take your life if you let it? Sin will overcome you, it will overwhelm you, it will give you stress, anxiety, fear, depression, all the things of this world, because that's what the devil did with sin and designed it to do so. But what we need is more God in our life and less sin. We need more of the Word of God, we need more of the truth, more of serving, because the, the old saying is that idle hands are of the devil's playground. So this morning, if we can do more, let's do it. If we can pray more, let's pray more. If we can lift each other up in prayer, let's do it. Let's do everything that we can as a church to seek the face of God together, to lift each other up in abundance and seek the Lord. Because sin, there is a deepness. And once you go dig a deep hole, the only way out, is there really one? But this morning, the deepness of sin, in Psalms 51.5, the Bible says, Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and sin did my mother conceive me. Now, if you think about that this morning, when you think about little babies and you're born, the Bible says that we are born of Satan's children. Could you imagine that today? Being born of a child of Satan. Because of the sin and the power that is in the world. But Jesus says, greater is me, greater is he that in you than in the world. And if we are confess our sins, we call upon the name of the Lord, we are saved. And if you're saved, you're no longer a child of Satan. You are a child of God. Isn't that amazing? Being and knowing that you are now a child of God. In Mark 7... Verses 20 through 23, the Bible says, And he said that which cometh out of man that defileth a man. From within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulterers, fornication, murderers, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, Le Leviticusness, evilness, eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these things come within that defile a man, and it comes from the heart. 
This morning, I hope that you can say, God, I don't want these things. I want you. Please take over my heart, my mind, my soul. And if we put God first, as the Bible says, that we should put God ultimately above all things with all heart, soul, mind, spirit, and truth. But I want to look at David. Because in verse 6, he says, and he sent Joab, sending to Uri the Hittite, and Joab sent to Uri David. Could you imagine being Uri, being out on the battlefront, fighting this fight, and all of a sudden you say, hey, the messenger comes and says, hey, you know, David needs to see you. And when Uri had come unto him, David demanded of him how Joab did, and how the people did, and how the war pros- prospered. Sorry, I got tongue tied there for a second. So he sends him out and he says, okay, what's going on in the war? You know, he was trying to cover up his sin to focus now back on the war. But one thing you can do, and what I want you to see this morning, not only is sin not secret, but the, the sin is so deep, not only is it affecting the messenger, but now it's affecting a man. Because now this man has come back from war, and his mind is on who? It is on his men still out there, and I'm still back here enjoying the things of we, we call it in the military the rear. So now he's sitting here, his sin that David has done has affected the messenger, now it's affecting Uri, but not only did it affect them too, it also affected Bathsheba. Could you imagine being Bathsheba this morning? These are for the wives out there. Could you imagine being Bathsheba this morning and a king's messenger coming to you saying, hey, now listen, I know you're Uri's wife, but King David wants you. Can you just go ahead and get dressed and go over and go to his palace? Could you imagine being a woman back then? Because women were so submissive back then, it was crazy. Because they just did exactly what they were told to do when they were told to do it, and they did exactly what they did. So think about this. Now she's going over there. She's with David. Now Uri's involved. Now the messenger's involved. Now David's got all these people wrapped up in his sin because he took the time to come back from war, right? And he walked down his balcony. He sees a woman over here bathing. He says, hmm, looks nice. Come on over. We've got to stop looking at the beauty of sin and look at the beauty of God. Amen. Leave the wickedness alone and seek the face of Almighty God because He's more beautiful than any sin that could ever be temptation of anything in your life. And I hope you realize that this morning because in 1 John chapter 3 and verse 4, the Bible says, Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. Now hear me out this morning. We don't live under the law anymore. We live under grace. Aren't you glad? We live under grace. The Ten Commandments are there to show us that we can never live up to that. But we now have a son called Jesus who shed his precious blood that day, who gave his life to pray for our sin debt. Now I want to ask you this morning. Nope, I'm not going to do it. I want to ask you this morning. If you, have you ever tried to list out all your sin? Because the Bible says that if we are to confess our sins... He is faithful and just forgives our sin. Have you ever taken the time when you're praying to list out every single sin? Because ultimately, you have to think about this. There's sin out there that we may not even realize is sin. And one thing that I'm trying this year, I'm a big dude. I like to eat. But the Bible says that we, should be, we shouldn't be covetousness. Right? I shouldn't eat so much that I'm, that I'm here. The Bible says if you don't work, you don't eat. The Bible says so many things that we should love God with all of our heart, all of our soul, our mind. And if we have things before God, that means we have idols. If you have an idol, that means you have sin. If you do the things out of the will of God, you are sinning. So guess what? This morning, we're all sinners. Can we acknowledge that? We are all sinners. But aren't you glad that we can call out to the name of Jesus and say, Lord, please forgive me. Save me. Because Jesus Christ is the intercessor. But now look at verse number 9. Because it says, But Uriah slept at the door of the king's house with all the servants of the Lord and went not down to his house. So David thought he could cover up his sin. Now he's saying, Call back Uriah from the battle. You go down there and lay with your wife. Now, because that's going to justify what I did. Right? How, long, how often do we try to justify our sin? Every day, every hour, every moment, every blink of an eye. Because we think that nobody realizes what's going on. Nobody hears what we're saying, what we're doing. But reality is, people are looking at you all the time. We talked about that in Sunday school this morning. right? If you'd like to hear more about it, please come to Sunday school, 945. You like that plug? Boo! But the most important thing right, that I want to share with you this morning is sin is like a, it's like a weed. Anybody ever had a garden before? And you go to weed that thing, and sometimes, a lot of times, when you go to pluck a weed, right, you just pull the top off. 
Well, then you go back a week later and that same weed's still there. And you're like, man, how'd that joker get? I just plucked that. Where'd it come from? And it's because we're not getting it from the roots. This morning as a church, we've got to pluck sin up from the roots. We've got to get it all. We've got to confess it all. We've got to realize the Bible says to pray without ceasing. Why do you think the Bible says to pray without ceasing? Because we're sinners. We are sinful natured people living in the flesh trying to please an almighty God. But we have to realize that the almighty God is greater than any of this flesh will ever be on any of these bones. This morning, I hope that you have the greatest desire, no matter how old you are, to live and to please and to serve Almighty God. Because one day when we get to heaven, glory, I can't wait to get there. But when we get to heaven and you stand before the judgment seat of Christ and you have to give an account on your life, I hope that we can say and hear the words, well done, thy good and faithful servant. You've been a faithful in a few things. I'm going to make you ruler of many things. But there's going to be a time in your life that you wish you would have done more. Amen. There's so many times in my life, I think about the 13 years that I ran from God, and I realized that, man, those 13 years of life that I absolutely wasted, and one day when I stand before God, I'll have to give an account on that. Because I was saved, I had made a profession of faith, but I was not living for God, I was living for myself. And you know what the sad part about this world is today, is everybody in this world is living for themselves. We're selfish, we're incompetent people. We are all worried about us, about how we look in the mirror, Whew, man. Yeah, I look good. Worried about what people think about us. Worried about what our neighbors say about us. Worried about what this is going on and that is going on. If we just worried about what God thought this world would be a different place. If we lived to please the Lord and not please ourselves, this world would be a different place. But yet we are people, we're flesh. We've got to forsake the flesh and cling to the old rugged cross. But now... In verse number 9, it says, when Uriah slept at the king's door, in verse number 10, and when they had told David, saying, Uriah went down unto his house, David said unto Uriah, Camest thou not for thy journey? When then didst thou not go down to thy house? And Uriah said unto David, The ark and Israel and Judah abide in the tents, and my lord Joab and the servants of my lord are encamped in the open fields. Shall I then go into mine house and eat and drink and lie with thy wife as thou livest and thy soul liveth? I will not do these things. Aren't you glad for a man who stood up for the reality of what was going on? Can I encourage you this morning? Can I ask everybody, can you stand up really quick? Can everybody just stand up? <clears throat> For some of you, that may have been a little difficult, but was that very hard? We've got to stand up for God. Uriah stood up for the men. He stood up for the camp. He stood up for what was going on because they were fighting against the people who were against God. This morning, I hope as a church, we can come together and take a stand and say, now listen, the world's not coming in here, and we're not going out there. We're going to serve God. Thank you. You can be seated. I just want to show you how easy it is to take a stand, to make a difference. The Bible says in the book of Romans, chapter number 8, do not be ashamed. But lastly, this morning, sin has a deep effect. You can't hide it. It goes really deep. But the effects of sin on your life and everyone around you it's so deep. And the Bible says in verse number 12, it says, And David said to Uriah, Tarry here a day also, and morrow, and I will let depart. So Uriah, Uriah abode in Jerusalem the day and the morrow. But could you imagine being Uriah? All he's thinking about is his men on that battle. Men dying and giving their lives for the Lord Jesus Christ, fighting against the Amalekites. But yet when David, in verse 37, when David called him, he did eat and drink before him and he made him drunk. David is trying everything he can to cover up his sin. You can't do it, folks. You cannot hide your sin and your sin affects other people. These effects go deep because, and he says, at the even he went to lie on his bed with the <coughs> servant of his Lord, but went not down to his house. He was intoxicated and he didn't even go to his house. He laid in the king's bed. And it came to pass in the morning when David wrote a letter to Joab and sent to the hand of Uriah. Could you imagine carrying a letter, your own death sentence this morning? Could you imagine carrying that? Because here we see, and he 
wrote in the letter saying, Set Uriah at the forefront of the hottest battle and retire ye from him that he may be smitten and die. It's so sad that David would take his right hand man, have him carry his own death sentence back to the forefront of the battle and to be, basically leave him there alone, David said, so they may be smitten and die. Do you know our, our sin, the things we do and the things we say, kill people around us? Not physically, but spiritually. Because if we say that we're a Christian, but we're not living like a Christian, how do you think that affects the people around us? But if we say that we're a Christian and we attend church faithfully, we're reading our Bible, we're praying, we're lifting people up, we're seeing God answering prayers, it's going to make a difference, folks. Not only in your life, but in the lives of the people around you. Come to church. What's keeping you coming from Sunday school? What's keeping you from coming from Wednesdays? Right? Come to church. Serve God. Edify. Learn the Word of God. Because one day the world's going to try to take this away. If we're honest and real with each other, the world every day tries to take this away. And we are the ones, the Bible says it is evident, that it is clear, that it will never return void. But... In verse number 17, And the men of the city went out and fought with Joab, and there fell some, men, some of the people of the servants of David, and Uri the Hittite died also. Then Joab sent and told David the, and the things concerning the war. Could you imagine being Joab? Could, be, could you imagine being Joab, being in the middle, being the messenger? Joab knew everything. Joab knew that he laid with Bathsheba. He sent her him over there to get her. Not only did he know that, but he also knew that he sent this letter with his right-hand man to take his life. In verse 19, And charged the messenger, saying, What thou hast made an end of telling the matters of war unto the king. He's saying, Now listen, you better keep your mouth shut. In verse number 20, And if it is so, the king's wrath arise. And he saying unto there, Wherefore approached ye so nigh unto the city when ye did fight? Knew ye not that the world shoot from, excuse me, they would shoot from the wall. Who smote Abimelech, the son of Jebuseth? Did not a woman cast a piece of millstone upon the from the wall that he died their best? Went nigh to the wall, and thou thy servant Uri the Hittite died also. So the messenger went and came and shewed David all that Joab had sent him for. And the messenger said, And David, surely the men prevailed against us and came out unto us, into the field, and we were upon even unto the entering of the gate. Could you imagine? Being these men, doing what they were told, serving King David, and now they're all being killed because of one man's sin. One. Could you imagine the ripples of your sin that affect the people around you. You know the greatest thing that stops a ripple effect? Stop throwing the rock. If you want to stop the ripple effect of sin in your life, stop throwing the rock. Cling to the Lord Jesus. Seek the face of God. Turn your back on sin. Turn to God. Why does that seem so hard as Christians today when people say, turn to God, and you're like, well, I have, well, I do, well, I do this, well, I do that. But we have to realize and understand, is it the will of God? In 1 John 5, 17, the Bible says, all unrighteousness is sin, and there is a sin not unto death. In Isaiah 59, in verse 2, the Bible says, but your iniquities have separated between you and God, and your sins hid his face from you that he will not hear you. Now I want to imagine something this morning. Thinking about your life. The Bible says that nothing, no man, no woman, no child, can pluck you out of the hand of God. But the Bible just said in the book of Isaiah, chapter 49, that your sin will separate you from God. 
and then we'll hide his face because your sin, if we're not confessing our sins, if we're not seeking the face of God, are we really saved this morning? Because we have to ask ourselves, if I'm enjoying sin more than I'm enjoying the Lord Jesus, then my life is not right with God. If my life is not right with God and it continues to not be right with God and there is no repentance and there is no change, the Bible says that all have come short of the glory of God and that all, once you confess your sins, the all, the old man, goes away. The new man is there to please the Lord. That ain't going to be no perfect man, no perfect woman, but it's going to be a changed man, a changed woman. Now, is there change taking place in your life? Are you still enjoying the things of this world? Are you enjoying the presence of God? This morning, we need to cling to God. We need to forsake our sins. We need to beg God to make us different. And we need to continue every day to seek the Lord Jesus. Could you imagine this morning, every single person in this room there's quite a few that aren't here today, but could you imagine this morning that a church confessing their sin, coming boldly together before the throne of God? Could you just imagine this morning what God could do with this church? Because there's always sin in the camp. If you imagine the Bible, when they went and defeated the city, they came back. And just for the sake of time, I'm going to paraphrase and bring it back to a small story. They said, don't now, when we go in there, don't take nothing. You leave everything, destroy it all. But yet those two fine folks, they brought it back to their tent. They dug a hole. They thought they could hide it. They buried it. They covered it up. They said, now listen, we're going to keep it. We're going to use it. And we're going to use it for our future. But yet God said, I told you not to take anything. And he took their lives. That's the same God we serve today. God says, greater is he that is in you. You don't need the things of this world. You don't need all the money. You don't need the fancy houses. You don't need the jobs. You need me. Come to me. All ye that are heavy laden, I will give you rest. Draw nigh to me, and I will draw nigh to you. He is the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but through the blood of Jesus. Does your life belong to God today? And if it does, what are you doing with it? Because if you're still here and you're still breathing, God still has a plan for you. It could be small because the Bible says if you are faithful in a few things, I will make you ruler of many things. Be found faithful, the Bible says. In James 1 and 15, the Bible says, Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. You know, there's one thing I will share this morning. I try, I'm trying to keep Sunday school and Sunday morning separate, but this is one thing i got to say. How many of you are excited to get to heaven? Because, man, I'll tell you what, I'm heaven-bound with a hammer down. I wish I could go 1,000 miles an hour to get there because there's not going to be the things of this world. There's going to be Jesus. Like I said, I'm a hugger. Man, I can't wait to hug him. I hope I can high-five him. But, no, but Mo, I do know that I will be on my knees. Because every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. There is no other way. He is the one who paid my debt. He is the one who took it upon himself to come to die for me. He took all of my sin that I can be in the presence of God in the most beautiful, ele elegant place you could ever imagine. How many of you have ever been to New York City before? How many of you have ever been to a bigger city before? When you walk into like these fancy buildings and they got these columns and these gold and these marble floors and they got this and they got that, there's no comparison to what heaven's going to be like. I can't even imagine or fathom what heaven's going to look like, but glory to God, I can't wait to get there. And I hope this morning you should be excited too because we should never be afraid of death if you're saved. But if you're not saved, glory to God, you should be terrified of dying because you're going to a place called hell, a place of gnashing of teeth and torment and a place where no man, no woman, no child, doesn't matter how loud you can scream, nobody's going to come save you. But aren't you glad for Jesus? The streets of gold, the heavens declare the glory of God, the angels singing that one day is for all of eternity. We get to worship Almighty God and serve and do. That's why, listen, I'm telling you right now, if you don't enjoy coming to church, what's it going to be like when we get to heaven? We're having church every day. Amen. Come on back to church because we're going to be having church every day. In the New Testament, I can take the Bible and show you they met every single day in somebody's house and they worshiped, they cried out, and they begged God to do something great. Are you guys begging God to do something great today? Are you praying that God raises this church 
makes a difference in our community. And I'll leave you with this, and I promise I'm done. In Psalm 66 and verse 18, the Bible says, If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. If we're living in sin and we're enjoying sin, the Lord will not hear you. In verse 24 of chapter number 11, the Bible says, And the shooters shot off the wall and upon the servants, and some of the king's servants be dead. And the servant Uriah and the Hittite is dead also. And David said unto the messenger, Thus shalt thou say unto Joab, Let not the thing displease thee, for the sword devoureth one as well as another. Make thy battle more strong against thy city, and overthrow it, and encourage thou him. And when thy wife of Uriah heard that Uriah her husband was dead, she mourned. Could you imagine being in her shoes? I can't. And lastly, and in closing, the Bible says, And when the morning was past, David sent and fetched her to his house. She became his wife and bare him a son. But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. I hope this morning that if you take anything away from this, if you can remember anything by the time you get to the car, you start the car and you start to drive out of the parking lot, that is our sin displeases the Lord. The greatest thing that we can do as Christians is to beg God to make a difference in our lives, that we can serve Him, that we can please Him, that we can live for Him, and most importantly, that we can bring people with us. Because this earth, when it is gone, you cannot take anything with you. Your bank accounts, your cars, your house, your family, friends. But what you can take are the people that are Christians, your family and friends that you've witnessed to, and they've gotten saved. But guess what? God wants to use you to bear witness to them of his glory. Amen. And I know today most of you have children, have great-grandchildren, have families, co-workers, neighbors. There's someone in your life right now today that needs the Lord. And if you're saved, I hope your desire is to reach them with the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Uh, Father, I thank you for your goodness and mercy. Father, I thank you for your never-ending word. Father, I pray right now it not return void. I pray that the ears that are listening... Father, I pray, please, just move amongst our hearts. Draw us close to you. Help us not to live in sin or enjoy the things of this world. Father, help us to come to church and help us to pray. Help us to seek your word. Father, help us to study to show thyself approved. Help us to lean on you. Help us to trust you. Father, help us to forsake the world. God, please do something great here at Red Lion Faith Chapel. Father, I'm begging you, as Peter stepped off the boat, help us to step out by faith. Help us not to get living in fear and doubt and, Lord, beginning to sink. Help us, Father, to stretch forth thy right hand of righteousness to the Father in heaven. Please, Lord Jesus, come now. Help us to be strong. Help us to be favorable. Help us to be not weary in well-doing. Help us to walk by faith and not by sight. Lord, help us to take the Bible and live a godly life, to be a beacon, a lighthouse into a dark and dying world. I thank you. I praise you. Come now, Lord Jesus, in the precious name of Jesus, I pray, amen. While Ms. Shuggy makes her way to the piano, if the, if the folks would like to come.